Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Paul Courant, university librarian and dean of libraries at the University of Michigan. He is also the Harold T. Shapiro Collegiate Professor of Public Policy, the Arthur F. Thurnau Professor of Economics and of Information, and faculty associate in the Institute for Social, Social Research at the University of Michigan. Courant has authored half a dozen books and over 70 papers covering a broad range of topics in economics and public policy. His recent work includes studying the economics of universities, the economics of libraries and archives, and the changes in the system of scholarly communication that derive from new information technologies. In 2004, before Courant became dean of libraries, he took part in negotiating the original version of the agreement between the Google Books Library Project and the University of Michigan Library to digitize its holdings. Through the project, Michigan's library has become the first in the world to have the majority of its collection digitized. As a guest of the Knight Library, Courant visited the University of Oregon on January 21, 2010 to give a lecture entitled, The Book, Not Just Another Gadget, which is part of the campus-wide Year of the Book series. Paul, welcome to UO Today. Thank you, Barbara. We're really pleased to have you speak with us today. I'm pleased to be here. I want to jump in with a large question, but I think you'll, you'll have no lack of answer for me. How does your long and distinguished background in economics and public policy inform your work as university librarian? That's a nice question. Um, so uh, in economics and public policy, um, and in policy economics, one thinks about how to design and implement systems to work better rather than worse. Um, and uh, in particular, the uh, very broad class of interesting problems emerge when there is technical change uh, that affects the way something is done. Um, uh, and in the case of libraries right now, the technical change affects the way everything is done. So the digital revolution, um, the advent of electronic resources of various kinds are changing the way in which we write, the way in which we read, the way in which we store information, the way in which we access it, the way in which we pay for it, basically the ways in which we do everything. Uh, and we have, um, uh, through history, a set of collections that are largely print uh, that are uh, importantly fragile uh, because so many of them were printed on, on acid paper. One can decry the, um, the behavior of large corporations today and their effect in the library world but the folks who dreamed up pulp, wood pulp paper um, made a lot of money off of it and left us with books that turned into cornflakes. But that's a, that's a side point. So, so we have these changes in technology which, which, um, which uh, are ill-adapted or for which the institutions that we have are not well-adapted, in particular legal institutions. So copyright law was actually designed for a world of print. And the way in which copyright law has evolved in the digital age, has made digital works much less usable uh, in many ways than print works would um, are, and much, much less usable than digital works could be. All of these are public policy problems that are bigger than any individual library, um, and which will require, I think, public solutions of various kinds, cooperative solutions across libraries, changes in legislation, uh, changes in the way that we engage with, with institutions outside of the library that are quite natural uh, for someone such as myself who has spent his career uh, thinking about, uh, about economics and public policy. Uh, the, other, the other economics point is really what do economists worry about? They worry about how do you handle scarce resources? Well, resources are becoming increasingly scarce. Um, in, in various ways, and again, the question of how best to adapt the library to the interests of the academy uh, as the technology changes is a good economics problem. I'm sure you're spending a lot of time with your, our librarian here, your colleagues in the field, talking about the, the economics of scarcity and what to do in these times of changing technologies. I'm sure, too, that you're talking a lot about the Google project. Could you explain a little bit, other than books turning to cornflakes when we open them. <laughs> what, you, what attracted you to the notion of the Google Books Library Project? Oh, sure. Um, uh, so uh, 
several years ago, the, when I was the provost of the university, the then librarian Bill Gosling showed up in my office and said he'd just been talking to Larry Page, who was the, one of the founders of Google and who's a, an alumnus of the University of Michigan, uh, which I think is part of how this got started, uh, and said that Page had just asked him, would we be interested in digitizing our entire collection? Um, and I said, so are we going to break the books? And he said, no, the technology is not going to break the books. Um, the books will be kept intact. And I actually said to Bill, so why wouldn't we be? Uh, and he said, there's no reason why we wouldn't be if they do it well enough. So let's figure out how to make sure that they did it, do it well enough. There are two things that emerge from that project, one of which is, is rock solid, the other of which is highly contested terrain. The rock solid one is we actually get a copy of everything in the library and all of those works that I talked about earlier that were printed on pulp paper are falling apart. So having a copy, having our own collection with an alternative copy that we can use at least in some ways uh, preserves for the indefinite future this remarkable collection of works that has been assembled over the last 150 years, 170 years by librarians and faculty at the University of Michigan. So if that's all there was, that would be an enormous uh, contribution because otherwise keeping the collection usable would have been much more difficult. So that's one piece. The contested piece is, gee, if you have the whole collection in digitized form, you can search it, you can index it, and maybe you can even read it depending on copyright law. Uh, and so there will be a digitized version of our collections that can be used as the principal exploration and use collection for most scholarly purposes. And it will be in the format that our students expect. They're actually a little shocked when they find something in the card catalog and they can't just read it. They're used to doing Google searches for everything. Uh, and of course they have access to most of the current journal literature electronically as well because we we license that literature. So what's missing from the, from the easy accessibility to our students and to the population generally is the printed literature of the 20th century. And this provided a possibility that the printed literature of the 20th century could become accessible. It wasn't automatic because without rights to it, there's no way that either the library or Google could display these works. And indeed, famously, Google only displays snippets of works that are in copyright through the Google Book Search project. But still, there was the possibility that once the resource existed, that society would figure out how to use it. At the moment, the most likely route is through the settlement agreement for a lawsuit. Uh, if that doesn't work, one can be hopeful that that other mechanisms will be fine as well. So there was a tremendous opportunity both to be a conservator, which librarians are, uh, which libraries are, but also to improve the ways in which these collections could be used. And that was a very attractive prospect. Was it really the entire collection? Everything, every bound periodical, every old book, every new and ephemeral piece? Um, not every new and ephemeral piece. Every bound work um, of more than 50 pages or so. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So the technology doesn't work very well for pamphlets, which is too bad because we have a lot of them. Of course, we have a lot of everything. Um, and some bound works that are very large format don't work very well. And some works are in bad enough shapes so that if you turn the pages, they crumble in your hand. Uh, and so those aren't in the project either. But to a first approximation, yes, every bound work. Um, now, publishers or rights holders could opt their works out, uh, and that has happened to some extent, but actually not very much. So we will have a quite good version of our collection in digital form. In fact, we already do um, uh, as a result of, uh, of, this, of this project. How much of it is done? Uh, we're, we're at a little over 5 million works done. Um, the possible universe is about 8 million, but there have been some opt-outs and there are some broken pieces, so I think the actual universe is going to be more like 7. So we're getting there. Now what about universal access? The, one of the big selling points of the project, of course, is to make this widely available to people who couldn't necessarily travel to Ann Arbor to look at the stacks. But there are not only co the copyright access issues, there's also um, the question of charging for users who are not within the Michigan system, right? We 
don't charge for anything that's, that is out of copyright. Mm -hmm. So anyone in the world with an internet connection um, uh, can search, find, and read any public domain work that has been digitized in this project uh, by Google, which is now getting up towards half a million books. Um, and actually, if you do that, you realize what the potential would be if we could look at all the other works as well, because it's extraordinary. You can search through the origin of species, find a phrase that you're interested in, do a concordance on that phrase, find all the other places it exists, and read them. You could, there's a little page turner application, which is very nice. Actually, Google's is nicer than ours, but ours is just fine. Uh, and, uh, and that is wide open. Um, what's not wide open is the work that's in copyright. You can search that, too. What you'll get back is page numbers where the phrase in question appears, um, and then you're stuck. Um, we now actually have a search gadget um, which allows you to search for a phrase across the collection, um, and so you can get page numbers from lots of different works in which a phrase appears, but then you're stuck. You, if you want to read them, you got to go to a library. If you do the search in Google, Google will tell you what's the nearest library that has this work. If you do the search in our catalog, It'll just tell you whether we have it or not, and if you're far away from us, that's not very helpful and quite frustrating. So there are still some practical issues involved in it. There the are, logistics. and it's uh, and and that is troubling. Um, I'd like it to be this open. I'd like it to be more open and to figure out a way that we could yeah. let people in. You know, I think that the Oregon Humanities Center recently hosted your colleague and friend Robert Darnton mm -hmm. from the Harvard Library. And you and he have an ongoing, friendly, very public debate, um, part of which has played out the New York Review of Books. And y although I think you're both basically proponents of the, of the digitizing of collections, you and he differ somewhat on your views on this, particularly about the Google Books settlement that recently took place. Could you explain where you differ from Darnton? So um, one is always cautious about characterizing the views of others, especially others whom one express, uh, respects as much as I respect Bob. Um, you know, he, after all, got me into the New York Review of Books, so I should be grateful for life. Um, uh, so, but I think that the, that, the, um, that the difference between us turns on a, uh, a set of related concerns um, where he would, well, maybe even a set of three, so one is he would prefer that this digitization take place or have been, would have been done under public auspices with public money, um, conceivably with a congressional amendment to copyright law that would have allowed the works to be more successful. This is a great public in, uh, undertaking uh, of great public good. And how is it that a private corporation uh, in agreement with um, representatives of publishers and authors, um, turns it into a commercial product when it could have been, should have been a, a sort of open public undertaking. And there I um, um, uh, would characterize his utopian vision as a utopian fantasy. So the, the disagreement between us is not whether that would be wonderful. The disagreement between us is that whether that would be possible. And my reading, and here I will, I will, I will play my card as a as a contemporary policy analyst, as distinct from a wonderful historian of of of, uh, of an older period in France. Um, when every time Congress has touched copyright law, it's made it worse. Um, it made it harder to use things. It's locked up more things. It's made it easier for commercial entities to exploit the copyright resource uh, that it has. Copyright law in the U.S. is based on a provision in the Constitution uh, which says in order to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, uh, exclusive use can be granted to authors and inventors for a limited time. That limited time in the first Copyright Act was 14 years. It then extended to 14 years renewable once, 28 years. It then extended to 28 years renewable once, 56 years. It's now the life of the author plus 70 years which means that even though ideas are meant to be and ought to be widely shared, but you want to have some incentive for people to produce them and write them down, it's the case that what you're writing down today, this, broadcast, this, this video that we're creating right now, will not be out of copyright uh, until 70 years after 
if, if I were the author, I'm actually not. UL has the rights in it, so it's going to be 95 years. But something you write down right now, not till 70 years after your death, which we hope will be many, many more than 70 years um, beyond now. And that's nutty. Um, uh, that, was, uh, that was done in the early 70s, that change in law. So Bob's notion, I think, that this should be a public project is extremely appealing. I've never seen a trace of evidence that um, we would get to it actually being done publicly. So that's, that's one piece. The second piece actually has to do with his concern about Google as a wielder of monopoly power. So Google will have this resource um, uh, under this settlement with the authors and publishers, and it will market it, and it will be the only entity um, that can market these scans, although there's nothing to stop someone else coming in and scanning again, um, but that would be expensive and perhaps wasteful. Um, so Google has that, and, and Bob has expressed repeatedly the concern that Google will act in the way that some of the commercial science publishers, in fact, he, the name he says at this point, and that I will echo his saying is Elsevier, um, basically charging a lot to libraries because serious research libraries cannot not have these, these resources. And here, our disagreement um, is one of, really it's a forecasting disagreement. So under the Google settlement, and this was very important to me when we were discussing with them as the settlement proceeded, 20% um, of the work, of the volume of the work, will be visible for free to anybody. That's actually a lot for a lot of purposes. So it's true if I want to read the whole book, I'm likely to go through this resource. Um, but I can, I can look at a lot of the book um, and through the 20%. 20 uh, and in fact, if I go into it a second time through a different search, I'll get a different 20%. So with some effort, I can look at quite a lot of a book for free under the Google settlement. There's no such analog with Elsevier. If you try to buy, look at an Elsevier product, you might get the abstract for free, but if you then want to read it as, a, as someone who doesn't have a license to it, they'll charge you 31 or 47 or some other large number of dollars, uh, and there's no free preview to be had at all. So that's, that's one very big difference. Another very big difference, which I think is, is important, uh, is that we, the libraries, will still have the books. Now, that's not perfect. Having the books is not a perfect substitute for the electronic access, but we really will still have the books. And so someone can come to the library and check a book out and read it. And, and so I, my concern about the monopoly power uh, is that there is much less than Bob's, also in part because this marvelous corpus of material that we, the great academic libraries, have collected over the decades uh, is, isn't in the same position in the marketplace as the most recent article in Cell or Nature, which you absolutely have to be able to cite that article to get your next NIH grant. Well, you're an historian, um, and yes, indeed, you have to be able to find the right book, but actually, you'll be able to find the right book. You'll be able to find it much better than you can now. Um, and if you need a copy of it, all right, you do it the old-fashioned way under inter interlibrary loan, and you read the book. And that will continue to be possible uh, under, the, uh, under the settlement as written. So the monopoly itself is weaker, I think, for a, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and that's the other big difference between Bob and me on this. Thank you for explaining that. And I know we asked him the same question when he was here in the I fall. I hope he gave a similar answer. Yeah, he did. He did. I, I'd love to have the two of you at the same table. I think that would be a fascinating discussion. Um, but in the meantime, your two interviews will make great companion pieces to each other. I have a question for you, though, a very practical one. In your answer just now, you referred to the possibility of simply going up into the stacks, finding the book, and reading it. That implies that we need to keep all those books on the shelves. We need to keep them all somewhere. Uh huh. Um, and that does pose an interesting question. So, so there. Let me let me sketch two different types of books in this in this story, and actually two different types of of libraries. There are some books that almost everybody has. There are some books where there are hundreds of copies, where there's a lot of overlap across research libraries. Um, and there really, you know, won't be a very good reason for us all to have copies as long as some of us have copies. And in fact, if we can figure out how to share copies, a tricky issue because actually libraries give up their ownership of things um, only um, under some 
screen. Um, one of the things I've said often is that if we're really going to take maximum advantage of the opportunities that we have before us in the library world, is we're going to have to get cheerful about giving stuff up and sharing. And we haven't been so much in the past, but that's a, that's a side point. But I can easily imagine that of things in which hundreds of copies are in dozens of, of libraries, we would shake that down to 10 or 20 copies held uh, nationwide. There would be places that you could go find the book. You'd have to, you know, if you want, and if you needed to send away for it to read it, well, then you'd do that. Um, uh, most academic libraries in the benign version of the Google settlement will subscribe to the product, and so they'll be able to get at it that way. And it may well be that users, in fact, I would expect our license certainly in Michigan would be that users who came into the library could also, in the library, read the electronic product. That's our, that's our position with essentially all of the resources that we hold. If you walk into our library, it's like a public library and anybody can, anybody can read anything. Um, it's not quite true because we have a couple of nasty licenses out there, but it would be true of this license. So that's, so, so we'd have copies. Now there are other books that are much less widely held. There are books that um, um, only, you know, Harvard has a copy. That, there are books that only Harvard has a copy. In fact, there are quite a few such books. And then there are books that Michigan has a copy, and then there's some that Michigan and Stanford and Berkeley have copies, but there aren't nearly as many copies. For those, again, we're going to have to make sure that there continues to be a physical copy for two reasons. One is sort of as backup, backup, right? Just in case something goes wrong with all the electrons, we still have a copy. The other is actually historical. Having a copy of the work in the form in which it was produced, not having that is just scares the heck out of me as a scholar, right? You want to be able to go back to a source that you know is the source, misprints and typos and all, um, and if the work was originally produced in print, which all of the works we're talking about right now were, then you want an original print copy someplace. You might almost never use it, but you very much want to have it. If you think of it, there's a sort of museum of text that it is incumbent upon the great research libraries to figure out how to hold. So yes, indeed, I'm not proposing that we give up last copies or even near last copies of the books. At the same time, where there are 100 copies, I think you can get down to 10 without hurting anybody very much, um, and thereby reducing the cost place on libraries so that they can spend the money on new acquisitions and other things that they're, that they're doing. So that's one of the areas in which there's a potential savings for large institutional libraries. Yeah. You know, one of the, 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 the big issues or the big um, topics of discussion to do with this whole digitization process has nothing really to do with the books themselves, but has to do with the prestige of the institutions that have what have until now been the biggest, most important research collections. It does stand to change the way we understand the appeal of a particular university, for example. If you don't need to go to Harvard, you don't need to go to Michigan to consult their collections, it has a kind of an egalitarian effect on institutions of higher learning. Do you see that as an interesting sidelight of all of this? I see that as an interesting main chance of all of this. Uh, I think it's extremely important and highly significant that that the one thing you don't hear from these libraries is we shouldn't do this because it's going to be a lost source of competitive advantage. Um, we're in the scholarship business. The scholarship business requires the easy and free or easy and free as possible exchange of ideas. And if undergraduates at the University of Oregon have as a result of this project access to a substantial chunk of the University of Michigan library collection, which is, which is a larger collection, that just has to be good news. Right? Somebody's going to pick up something that she otherwise wouldn't have found easily and make something of it. And that's exactly what whoever wrote that monograph wants to have had happen. Um, and we collected it for our people because it was a source of competitive advantage. Good for us. Uh, and now it will be much less so. The, the, uh, the library collections, the sort of regular library collections of widely published works will become much less important in, in as, a, as a piece of the quality of the institution than it used to be. And that I think that's just good news.
Um, that brings me to a quotation of yours that I read in a recent um, print interview in the Michigan Daily back in October. I think the sentence was, the problem of converting information to knowledge and knowledge into wisdom is every bit as important as it always was, which seems to speak to the overall endeavor that we're all involved in, not just institutionally specific holdings. Very much so, and I think that the that, that libraries that are good at that, at figuring out how to navigate this new environment of, of highly electronic works, many of which were produced electronically and which will not be nearly uh, as clearly labeled and cataloged as older works, older works are. So libraries that are good at converting um, information into knowledge and knowledge into wisdom and to helping their faculties and students in that exercise will continue to be very important sources of of strength for the universities that are that are good at that. So there's an appealing part uh, part there as well. You know, I know that you're very interested in um, issues of archiving web content. You are really interested in social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter or even YouTube. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, so perhaps I can limit my question on that area of your interest to your blog. Now, the French professor in me loves the fact that it's called Au Courant, or Au Courant, I suppose we would call it, using your name. What do you blog about, just to finish us up today? Uh, I blog about a variety of things, I, um, about libraries and books and baseball and uh, motorcycles <laughs> and other things that are of, uh, of, uh, of interest, uh, interest to me. It's an interesting form um, the blog because it's not quite clear who the audience is and it's not quite clear what the standards of proof are. Um, my favorite blog entries uh, are actually sentimental. There's one about the closing of Cody's bookstore in Berkeley which is one of the great bookstores and just exactly how are we to live without um, uh, bookstores. And There's one about going to a baseball game at Yankee Stadium um, during its, uh, its last uh, Season. So I view the blog as a, as a way of connecting the, uh, the past uh, and the future. And I think the problem of, our, of, of cultural ephemera in a world where people are, are randomly producing terabytes of news every day is going to be a really big problem for us. I think we're going to leave it on that provocative okay. sentence. <laughs> Paul, thanks so much for talking to me. Thank you. My pleasure. We've been speaking with Professor Paul Courant, University Librarian and Dean of Libraries at the University of Michigan. On January 21, 2010, he gave a lecture at the U of O entitled, The Book, Not Just Another Gadget, at Knight Library on the U of O campus. Thank you for watching and see you next time.